All right, there she goes. Can you see my screen, the, the main screen? Yes. Yes, okay. So yes, it's wonderful uh, and uh, we've had some great talks. I wanted to first say thank you to CASPA for putting this wonderful conference on again. I know it was a big change to do it virtually uh, and happy 29th anniversary. It was also very impressive to see how much CASPA has done this year, especially with COVID in a very difficult year. You can see how important this organization is. And I know for me, I have a lot of friends I've developed over time. Uh, also wanted to say thank you to uh, Sung, Sung Ju uh, for his work this year and also congratulations to uh, Xiao Dan Zhang for uh, him moving into the presidency. So we, we really appreciated also the great speakers as uh, Yang said, um, and I think we hope to then bring that all together in this panel. Uh, maybe just a few things about the panel. Um, if you look at memory and big data, in the beginning, when you thought about data many, many years ago, uh, it was really big hardware. Uh, to store anything took something very huge. Uh, kind of over time, we fixed the, the big hardware problem, but now we're really faced with uh, you know, fixing this. We've enabled big data. And I think as you've heard today, the data is very valuable, but it isn't valuable until we can uh, you know, really analyze it and utilize it uh, to, to help us in our daily lives. And that's really the challenge. If you look at it, data continues to grow. I think we heard that across many areas. And we also heard today we're only, uh, you know, analyzing about 2% of the data. And in the next few years, there will be just, you know, over 50 billion devices connected around the world processing and generating data. And I think we saw one of the talks uh, also talked about how much data even one self-driving car can, can create every hour. So it's really important that we're able to put all this together or what's gonna happen is we're just gonna have all this data that's useless to us. Um, or if we can't keep up with, I think, I think uh, Dr. Bohan's talk at the end about you know, cutting down you know, the, uh, you know, the, the urinary scaling so that we can really uh, you know, scale. And as uh, Dr. Ryan said about encryption is gonna be critical, but it takes so much computation we're going to need to solve these problems and that's what this panel is here to talk about today. So we're on the edge of what we've been talking about is really moving from kind of the digital era to the digitalization era and they, they sound familiar, but uh, you know, I once saw uh, a VP at Intel, Carolyn Seward talk and one of the things she said was historically we've been bringing the compute to the data um, or excuse me, the data to compute. Now we really have to bring the compute to data. In other words, data is now the king and we have to start analyzing it. But there are all these challenges if you, you've heard today that we have to go through. And so today, uh, the panelists want to talk about their specific disciplines and, and how they're, uh, they, they're, they see to meet these challenges. And what we hope to cover and really round up what, what, what everybody's talked about today. But we heard really uh, when Rinchen talked, it is really bringing together big data, AI, um, and, and 5G or high-speed computing, uh, you know, all together, both the, you know, both moving to new architectures, but also the communication speeds are really, really uh, critical for us to move forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panelists uh, and, and then we can get into the talks. Uh, first up will be um, Brandon Wong. He is uh, from Synopsys. He's a vice president of Synopsys. He's overseeing their strategic initiatives for the company's uh, main core business, which is about three billion in size. Before Synopsys, Brandon is he's been an executive at Cadence. Uh, you just saw Cadence uh, talk earlier, as in that he was in the chief strategy office, uh, marketing and solution engineering, uh, and many many management roles. He's also had many roles at, at a lot of large larger tech companies uh, and some startups uh, and also seven years at ARM. So Brandon's very well-rounded and we look forward to hearing from him. Uh, he's an electrical and computer engineer. Uh, also, uh, he has his MBA from Wharton School of uh, University in Pennsylvania. He holds 10 US patents and has published uh, 20 plus conferences on journals and both invited talks. So we look forward to hearing from Brandon. Also on the panel today is, uh, is, is Nancy or, or Kathy Liu. Uh, getting to know everybody. She told me she's an avid marathon runner. And even during COVID, she's competed in marathons virtually. 
which again couldn't be done without all, all the things we do in, in the electronics world. Uh, she's a distinguished engineer and director, and she heads up Broadcom Surtees Architecture and Modeling Group. Uh, previously, uh, Kathy worked at, as an R&D director and distinguished engineer at Avago LSI, which was acquired by Broadcom. And she's also published in many journals and conferences and, and holds 20 patents as well. Also today is uh, Norman Chong. Uh, he's, uh, he enjoys, by the way, tennis, especially in the morning, I think he told me. So don't try and set up a meeting with him in the morning. He's, he's out working on tennis. But um, he, he was co-founder of Apache Design Solutions and currently serves as ANSYS Fellow and Chief Technologist for the Semiconductor Business Unit. Uh, Dr. Chong received his PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from UC Berk Berkeley in California. He also holds 18 patents and has, an, has author, authored over 50, uh, 50 papers. Uh, next in the panel will be uh, Robert Fan. Uh, he enjoys golfing. Um, we were talking, I don't think either of us is ready for the PGA Tour anytime soon, but uh, using this year, Robert says, to help perfect his game. In his spare time, he also volunteers as a mentor uh, and, and tries to help in the community. He's uh, president of Silicon Motion Incorporated USA. He's responsible for their largest regions, corporate communications, PR, strategic partnerships, and investments, and serves as a general manager for their graphics business. Uh, prior to Silicon Motion, Robert was in many executive positions at Spansion, IDT, uh, startups like Burkana, which was acquired by Qualcomm, also Resinext, which was acquired by RF Devices. He spent nine years at Intel in sales and marketing and management positions. Uh, Robert holds a, a BS in, in EE from UC Berkeley, uh, MS EE from Santa Clara University, and completed general management executive program at McCombs School of, um, or McCombs School of Business in the University of Texas. Also coming to us from Korea, so getting up early in the morning is uh, Sung Soo Chung, uh, and he's zooming in. From, as I said, uh, he enjoys photography and vide videography, plus doing community service where he, he said he really enjoys putting smile on people's faces. Uh, Sung's a CTO of QRT, and prior to QRT, he was actually joined part of a Korean, uh, the Korean government's brain scouting program where he joined Hong Yang University as a research professor. And before that, he spent 15 years at, at Cisco Systems. So uh, he, uh, he holds 17 US and Korean patents and has contributed to over 50 technical papers. So you can see we have a very strong uh, panel. Uh, I think we can uh, really start to move forward. Each panelist will present for about five to seven minutes and then that'll be about a total of 30 minutes, I mean, 40 minutes. And then they'll also be talking about one of their key challenges. And after that, we will, uh, the presentation completed, there'll be actually a poll so you can vote on what you think is one of the key challenges, as well as we'll proceed into, into questions. And just like you've been doing now, you can use the Zoom chat to ask questions and we'll work to work to answer them. And then towards the end, we'll go ahead and, uh, and, and show the, uh, the panel, the poll results to you. So with no further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Brandon and have him uh, present to everybody. Brandon? Thank you, Dave. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Super. Let me share my screen. OK, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into the topic uh, I'd like to discuss which is the key to the hardware security. So um, you heard the news uh, a couple of years ago, the hackers broke into the casinos, uh, high rollers database through a fish tank. Later on they find out it was a physical templing through a small connected thermal stack. It's a small IoT device that's connected through Wi-Fi. And it was a physical temp. So it's a hardware related security breakdown. And then, um, you know, the, the, the electrical car safety system is also break down through, um, again, a, a physical hardware templing by bypassing uh, all the anti-hacking shield, right? And then the last one was um, the... Is 
lose Brandon's voice. Yeah, Brandon, you are broken out. Air security, uh, you know, at the silicon and hardware system level, that's including SOCs, IPs, and sensors. And that brought the community of all the design engineer um, to look at how do I be able to, um, you know, uh, build the silicon engineering that has the hardware security working together with the software, the existing software security layer. So you know the silicon design is always about optimized power, performance, and area. Now with Keep losing, Brandon. What screen? You guys see this one? Yeah, sorry, Brandon, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Um, can you and also, one? which slides are you in? Yeah. I haven't seen the slides uh, change. So maybe what we do, Yang, can you? Um, we can move to have Kathy start and can you uh, see if you can talk to Brandon and we can reduce his network uh, level somehow so he can. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Kathy can. Uh... Okay, so maybe I just uh, take over when uh, yeah. Brandon has uh, fixed his issue. Yeah. Fix his issue, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like uh, switch chip designers, my focus for this panel will be uh, next generation data center networking services for Silicon, how they, you know, the role to play with our big data era. So uh, with the growth of 5G uh, data traffic and AI computing, the data center requires faster connectivity to meet increasing bandwidth. Just an example here is a Google's uh, data center picture on the left-hand side. And also on the right-hand side, you can see the data center uh, traffic continues, rapidly grows in the last 10 years, and it will stop in, uh, in the near future. I believe the same trending will apply to other companies' um, uh, data center, like Microsoft's, uh, Facebook's, or Amazon's, and so on. On the top of that, in, in 2020, everybody noticed, and during the age of COVID-19, most of people, in, like me, have to work from home. My kids have to you know, study or learn from home, and then socialize from home exercise from home and then watch movies from home. And all of those uh, create data and traffic explosion. And probably the same thing, like my family, you might also experience internet speed issues here and there and since March uh, this year. And so how to address those problems, I believe increased bandwidth would be one of the solutions for the answer. So now let's uh, start with the data center uh, interconnection technology evolution. You can see this plot from uh, 13 years ago, 2007, 10 gig port, and then go all the way up to 800 gig port is this year. So the front panel has the speed doubles every two years. Well, the power hasn't, doesn't increase along with the speed. 
you can see the one watt for 10 gig port. And then it's go up to only less than 20 watt for 800 gig. So the Pico 2 per bit is reduced actually. And there are quite a few uh, technology innovations happened in the last decades to ensure higher bandwidth, but with lower power and cost. One of them is modulation has been changed from MR3 to PAN4, two levels to four levels. The other one is the core density. The number of lengths of optical or the copper cables has increased from a single lane per port to multiple lanes, like four or eight lanes per port. If we continue, we want to double in the port, uh, the bandwidth beyond 800 gig, the next one, the speed node, I believe will be 1.6 terabits per second. And there's a challenge for sure to achieve that goal. And how can we achieve uh, the speed without increasing the power and the cost is one challenge. The other one is, do we need to increase the modulation levels farther from PAN4 to even higher? Or do we need to replace the pluggable module to more for packaging optics like other the previous speakers already mentioned? And so after the front panel interconnect, let's also look into the chassis inside the data center. The switching ASIC inside the chassis has similar trend and an evolution as well. So you can see the switch capacity has increased from 640 gigabit per second 10 years ago to 25 terabits per second in the last 10 years and also double every two years as well. And if you see our Broadcom's product from Tomahawk 1 to Tomahawk 4 is a switch chip. The Broadcom has been the industry leader on the switch ASIC. And how can, in the now, we are working on the next generation's Tomahawk 5 switch product, which will be a 50 terabits per second capacity switch. And it will be the more length of I.O or a higher speed per lane. It really depends on the next slides I'm going to talk about, the high-speed service performance, bandwidth and power trade-offs. So service is like a previous speaker already introduced to you guys, is a popular name for the high-speed IO transceiver. On the transmitter side, the service the serialize the signal and then the drive out from a chip. And then at the receiver side, a service will receive and recover the signals from a lossy channel and deserialize to the parallel, goes into the, the chip core. As a service architect has been asked the question, what is next generation's I.O. speed? Will it go 200 gigabit per second or something else? Or the next generation I.O. can still go over the, the copper transmission line, or we have to go with optical everywhere. So my answer is depends. It depends on our service IPs, the performance, bandwidth, and the power trade-offs. So that hand, the figure give you the service data rate, reach distance, and the versus the year of introduction. You can see the service data rate increase from um, like a 10, one gigabit per second in 2000, and then it's uh, to the 100 gigabit per second in 2018. Also double every two to three years. And if you look at the reach distance of the service, unfortunately, you know, you ideally want to see the distance keep going up longer or keep the same, right? Unfortunately, you see the distance in short. And with the data rate in the last two generations. And then the reference side is the power of the service, right? The power efficiency, the people do per bit. And when, uh, you know, ideally we want to see the power continue decrease people do per bit when the, the speed go up. Unfortunately, we see that trending is slow down in the last two generations as well. So the, the biggest challenge 
to the service designers will be with next generation literate will go continue go higher and higher. How can we, you know, change the slope and then make the service performance literate go higher, higher, but lower power and cost? For this kind of, unfortunately, I don't have the solid answer, at least for now, but I would like to bring up a few innovation ideas to help us to get in next generations which like double the, the fault rate and from 100 gig to 200 gig, or we can adopt more advanced modulation schemes, not only PAN4, but maybe PAN8 or even PAN. Or we have to replace the electrical or copper transmission lines more with the optics, optical uh, transmission lines. So at the end, we hope you know, um, I hope, you know, the panelists, speakers, or the audience can work together to find the solutions. So that is my uh, end of my slides. Next, I, I'm not sure if um, Brandon come back or I give the time to Norm Norman. Go ahead and go to Norman, yeah. Okay. Follow the... the the order. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Let me share my slides. Uh, is my audio okay? Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, very glad to be here. And this is a wonderful conference uh, that I attended every year and I learned a lot. Uh, for the two topics I'm going to cover uh, today is uh, the 3D IC reliability and also the hardware security uh, for the upcoming semiconductor chip packaging system. So before that, uh, maybe some of you don't know about ANSYS. So ANSYS is a $30 billion market cap company. Uh, it's about 1.5 billion to 1.6 billion revenue. And what we do is all on simulation and the simulation on different areas, including the mechanical, fluent, uh, electromagnetics. Uh, myself is coming from semiconductor. And we also do the embedded systems and also optical simulation that we acquired in America earlier this year. And everything we do at Semiconductor BU is based on the distributed computational platform. It's called a Seascape. And we build uh, different kinds of uh, products on this platform. And we can use uh, hundreds of uh, codes and also across the machines, uh, up to 2,000, 3,000 uh, codes that we can use. And if you look at the IC design tool as, a, as an airplane, and uh, the wings actually is a metaphysics simulation that will keep the airplane flowing. And this is what we do. We cover the power integrity thermal reliability, EMI, ENC, mechanical, electromagnetics, and uh, uh, for the most recently, uh, covering the silicon photonics and also the hardware security. So I think Brendan touched a little bit about the hardware security, and this is becoming a very serious issue that uh, if you look at the articles coming from the news, uh, there's a T2 announced uh, two weeks ago, that uh, the T2 chip coming from Apple that uh, used in the MacBook uh, during the boot up uh, sequence that can be broken and that can take over your uh, laptop control. And there's also the TI chip uh, that has the connection to the Wi-Fi server and people can take over uh, the so-called breathing bit and take over the whole uh, router. And there's a microarchitecture problem as well for the sampling uh, in the Intel uh, for example, for the spectral in the meltdown problem, that is based on branch prediction uh, for the timing side channel information. And there's other problems in the Android chip, uh, in the Snapdragon chip, for example. So if you look at the threat models uh, nowadays, it covers uh, side channel attack, uh, which is, can be a physical physics-based attack, or can be a microarchitecture attack. There's a hardware Trojan problem uh, and for with uh, reverse engineering. 
and there's a very serious uh, IC counterfeiting with the billions of dollars of the reused uh, chips or even the uh, grab the design and then redo the IC manufacturing. So that's the uh, focus on the physics-based uh, side channel attack. And if you look at the side channel information that you can get uh, from the encryption operation of the chip, uh, from the side channel information such as the uh, power uh, monitoring and the power noise monitoring, electromagnetic emission, and also the thermal signatures uh, on top of the chip or from the thermal sensor that you can get this information and can use this information through the statistical operation and you will be able to crack the key. So this is categorized as a non-invasive uh, operation or the semi-invasive operation or the invasive operation with the removal of the packaging to crack the key. So there's a problem that you don't want to wait until the silicon tap out, that will be too late. Uh, you want to fix the problem as early as possible to identify the weakness of the security. And the best way is uh, starting from the RTR level or the gate level. And then also during the layout, you want to do a side channel simulation uh, for the electromagnetic the substrate side channel, thermal side channel, and also the power side channel to detect the problem as early as possible. But there's only one issue that for the side channel simulation, it takes thousands of vectors or thousands of payloads and uh, plain text, or even millions of uh, plain text that you need to do the simulation. So that takes a long, long time. And usually for the IREM sign up, it only takes a couple of cycles or tens or 20 cycles uh, to do the sign up. So this is the main problem that we need to conquer. So for the power noise and the power side channel and the electromagnetic side channel, uh, especially for the near field, uh, what we do is that we provide the simulation and overcome the limitation of the long cycles of simulation. Uh, we have a different kind of techniques using the reduce all the modeling and also the thermal with the all kinds of innovation in order to speed out the simulation uh, to monitor the power noise side channel and also the electromagnetic side channel in order to crack the key. So the other important problem is uh, 3D IC reliability. That according to Dr. Yu uh, from TSMC at ECTC keynote this year, that uh, they are seeing that beyond the Moore's law that can be achieved by the 3D IC. If you look at the local density uh, vertically, that can go beyond and follow the Moore's law uh, in terms of the 3D, uh, 3D IC uh, footprint. So the problem of 3D IC that if you have a vertically stacked dice, especially more than three dice, uh, for the second case from the left, that it's very hard to do a, a thermal mitigation for the center of the die. That uh, you don't know what the power budgeting, the power partitioning of the of the many chips in the SOIC or the or the silicon on wafer configuration, and so you have to do. Uh, uh, quite a few things uh, in order to make a 3D IC work. So temperature becomes the fourth dimension that you need to look at. So there are several problems that uh, we can see from the last slide. The first one is that uh, during the configuration of the architecture level quantity analysis, that you have to take care of the power budgeting and power partitioning. And then you have to check what's the change in thermal profile very quickly. So you rely on a very fast method to do that. And when we move to the layout level, that uh, usually that uh, if you do a 10 micron by 10 micron uh, resolution with a one micron resolution grid, in terms of the finite element method uh, for 1.6 centimeter by 1.6 centimeter chip, that can take more than 12 hours or 24 hours. So we need a very accurate thermal stress analysis. And that's why we use a hierarchical thermal engine that is published at uh, Semi-Therm this year. Now we can speed up the simulation, thermal simulation, especially for 100 times or 1,000 times faster in order to achieve that purpose. That can also be used in a thermal side channel simulation. When we move to the diagnosis and the infield monitoring, this one generates tremendous amount of data, from, particularly from the infield monitoring, that uh, coming from the protein tags, more tag, or analog bits, that uh, they do the detailed monitoring of the 3D IC design. And with a whole bunch of the tremendous amount of data, how did you correlate with the simulation? So the model-based digital twins is needed. So for that, 
I think there are two major issues for the upcoming chip packaging system. The first one is uh, hardware security, uh, starting from the RTR level, gear level to the layout level, and have to overcome the long simulation cycle. And a lot of uh, tremendous amount of data is generated from the simulation also measurement. The second area is the 3D IC reliability, especially temperature coming as a fourth dimension. That's the new metrics that we need to take care of, especially for 3D IC design with the many, many chips uh, in the design. So there's a thermal issue, thermal induced stress, and uh, there's an application specific reliability. And we also need to deal with a tremendous amount of data coming from the infield monitoring or model based digital twin. So that's the two areas that I hope that you can vote for one of these two areas as uh, one of the uh, upcoming challenges that we need to deal with. Thank you. So for that, I will give it to uh, Robert, uh, David. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Norm. Uh, and thank you, David, for the uh, earlier introduction. Let me share my screen with everyone. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, yes. Can see it. All right, great. Uh, so first of all, I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, on this topic and also with uh, other distinguished panelists. And uh, so my talk today is going to talk about the, how to enable big data storage with NAND flash storage. Uh, so just in summary, the NAND flash storage uh, is gonna enable big data storage uh, across all the different devices. And uh, NAND flash storage is enabled in particularly by the controller and controller is effectively the brains of the NAND flash storage device. And there's a number of different innovations that are centered around the controller technology. It's not just a silicon, but it is the software as well as the system integration work that goes into it. And one of the key challenges and innovation areas for the NAND flash storage and the controller specifically is the ECC technology which is critical in supporting future NAND technologies. So uh, going to the slides uh, very quickly, uh, 3D NAND technology is going to unleash big data storage because uh, NAND flash is volatile. It is uh, lower cost than DRAM and it is faster than the uh, uh, hard disk drive. And, uh, and it's gonna be, as the prices come down, the capacity goes up is gonna be pervasive in many different uh, big data storage applications. So in fact, we, we view big data as ranging from uh, devices on the edge all the way to the cloud, from smartphones all the way to the servers and the data centers. So for the uh, mobile devices, uh, the latest smartphone come with um, 128 gigabyte of storage, uh, the desktop and the mobile. Have SSDs uh, that are replacing hard disk drives and the capacity of SSDs. Everybody, uh, and, uh, and the servers and data centers, uh, the hard disk drives are being replaced with uh, SSDs for faster performance. So uh, as you can see, uh, NAND flash is enabling big data storage across the different devices. So uh, the NAND flash storage, however, is going, is going to be enabled primarily by the controller. The controller is basically the brains. It sits between their interface as well as the NAND flash. The NAND flash devices are, are basically memory semiconductor devices. It's the NAND controller that handles the functions to make the, and give the personality to the uh, storage device. So the NAND controller will handle the system interface uh, let it be a PCIe or UFS or USB, and also handles the interface to the NAND, like OMPI, and you would uh, evolve with the different higher speed NAND interfaces in the future. Uh, in some cases, uh, the controller needs the DRAM, so the NAND controller needs to have a DRAM interface and to support the advances in that interface as they go into DDR5 and beyond, 
And also one of the key critical differentiations of the NAND controller is the NAND management uh, logic and framework that handles the ECC garbage collection. Uh, and then in some cases, uh, in order to decouple uh, the, the, the performance in the system with the NAND flash, there's gonna be some amount of data buffer required. And uh, as the last speaker talked about, security is one of the key concerns in the storage devices and the uh, controller will handle all the security needs of the, of the storage device. So very quickly, uh, the NAND controller in the NAND storage device is centered around three different areas. Number one is the chip technology, the solution, as well as the design integration. The chip technology, the, uh, the innovations are very uh, common, uh, basically moving for technology nodes from 28 to 16 to seven nanometer. Uh, to support new interfaces, we have to engage with IP vendors. In many cases, we develop our own IP for advanced interfaces in PCIe, higher speed, PHY, uh, to support the different uh, type of uh, links. Physical design, um, one of the key critical requirements for NAND storage is that it is low cost and low power. So physical design becomes a very critical part of, the, of, a, of a chip technology evolution. And last but not least, uh, as uh, Ingo talked earlier, uh, we always employ uh, advances in the packaging to enable lower cost, uh, lower power, and uh, high performance uh, chip, chip designs. Um, so the second level of innovation is in system solutions. So the chip is just a chip, but we actually have a lot of firmware that is, uh, it, that is required to enable the controller to work with the different NAND devices. And the firmware not only uh, provides the, what are called the personality to the system, but also also enables the customers to, uh, to uh, offer some, some differentiation, the customization in their own uh, products. And uh, we also offer the, not only the firmware, but the complete solution, the PCB, as well as some of the test and qualification uh, systems and firmware. And, uh, and some technologies that are inherent in the NAND storage device that includes both the hardware and the software. Uh, it's all part of the system solutions that comes with uh, the chip. Uh, last but not least, one of the key critical innovations that uh, in, is in our business is system integration. This is basically taking the chip with the flash and, and make it work in the target system. Since a lot of our uh, the NAND storage devices are going to consumer devices. So it is imperative that this product become plug, uh, plug and play. Let it be in a smartphone, let it be in a, in a, in a PC, a notebook system or a server or in your car. This devices needs to be qualified, needs to be validated, and it also needs to be compatible with the standard interfaces out there. And this requires a lot of system tests, different corner cases, through and through different uh, stages of the design. So a lot of this and, and a lot of this is not necessarily IP, but it's definitely know-how that is acquired through many different experiences and, and uh, through this process. So um, SMI, we basically, we provide uh, controllers that address all these different uh, applications and form factors from consumers to uh, data centers. Uh, and one of our key differentiations and services is that we offer the complete solution. We offer the chip, the firmware, we offer the PCB, the SDK as well. And in other words, the full turnkey solution for our customers to take our product to production in a very, very quick, uh, fast amount of time. So the company were leader, leader in this space. Uh, we shipped over 6 billion NAND controllers in the last 10 years. Uh, and we do business with all the major uh, memory vendors and as well as the uh, SSD and, and, and the storage device vendors around the world. And the uh, last slide is, as I mentioned earlier, the key challenge innovation for our business is the ECC technology that is, is integrated in our controller and our firmware. This is critical to support the future NAND technologies as the NAND becomes higher capacity, becomes a lower cost. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to introduce the pass on to the next speaker, San Su Chang, who is the CTO of QRT. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my slide. Uh, 
Um, let me see. Hope you can see the slide. Uh, not, not yet. We still see you. Maybe. Okay. What about now? Uh, somehow you still have sharing your main screen, your 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 camera screen. Okay, so I have to move this uh, down to my. Uh, I have two screens. That's why I think it's uh, it's doing something. Yeah, something weird. Uh, let me try uh, something else. Did you share screen? Yes, I did. Um, can you see now? Uh, still seeing your 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 picture. You you just your your video. Maybe we can ask a yeah. to play the video. Play this. Yeah, maybe, yeah. For you. Yeah, okay. do you need a backup? Yeah, I can. Yeah, let's go to backup. OK, why don't you do that? I think it's, um, I have a dual screen, and it doesn't seem like uh, yeah, um, to have the boss of, uh, yeah, I wanted to share it. So I actually did uh, sharing the screen, but it doesn't show up. Sure, Mr. Chung, uh, I can flip the slide for you. Everybody's face in the, in the screen. Yeah, this is Zabin here. Okay. I can flip the slide for that? you. Yes, and let me know if you want to move on to the next slides. Can you see okay. the slides now? Okay. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Um, I like to say thank you for the uh, CASPA for uh, hosting the conference and also wanted to say thank you for David for the uh, coordinating and the helping people to join the panel session. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, about two minutes to go over QLT company. I think it's uh, a little bit strange uh, to join the CASPA uh, from Korea, but also the different segment of the business. So it will be pertinent for everybody to understand what we are doing. And also about five more minutes, I'm gonna go over uh, two topics uh, for the uh, innovation in big data. Next slide. Uh, QRT is actually a very old company. It's a 38 years old. We started with uh, Hyundai Electronics, and now we uh, become independent. Uh, once we are part of the SK Hynix, uh, many of the uh, our facility and, and analysis and the test uh, is incorporated inside the campus of the SK Hynix. Next page, please. Next page. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a multiple site. Uh, we have uh, four different sites in Korea. And also, we have um, China Wuxi facility. And we have a joint venture in the United States. So we have uh, the office in Japan as well. And what we do is um, reliability and the failure analysis test. Especially in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, we specialize in failure analysis and also reverse engineering. And also we support the softwares and uh, the many reliability tests. Uh, we have done many of the uh, nanoscale um, analysis uh, for uh, reliability test as well as the uh, reverse engineering. And also we do a chemical analysis of the semiconductor materials uh, all the way to uh, atomic levels. Next page. Next page, please. I'm on the page of domestic and global business size. Are you on the same page? Are you seeing the same page? Uh, yes, next page, please. Sure. 
Yeah. Okay, so this is the one of the services we do and work with automotive industry worldwide. And we actually test almost all the components except the uh, mechanical engines, but we do a reliability test, shock and vibrations, and also mechanical test. And nowadays we do have a more electrical and uh, testing and the mechanical, chemical, electrical combined testing is a uh, key part of the testing. Uh, this is more important and uh, more relevant uh, for the functional safety and the autonomous driving vehicles has all electronic parts. So we do all the support for the reliability of the vehicles. Next page, please. Um, this is the one of the tests we do. Uh, I'm going to talk about SSD uh, reliability demonstration test. Uh, we test almost all the uh, form factors and all different capacities. Uh, now we have um, almost uh, every aspect of the testing we do. Normally uh, we have about a thousand devices. Uh, we run about the 2000 hours. Um, you can imagine that you have a five terabyte device testing uh, 200, uh, 2,000 of them, about 2,000 hours. Uh, that's a lot of data we actually collect. And that data has to be analyzed in order to see uh, performance and the degradation and also endurance and all the other aspect of the software interactions with uh, a fresh device as well as the uh, file systems. So we uh, do have a capacity to perform the test and also extract tremendous amount of data to analyze and the process. Next page, please. <clears throat> uh, we just finished the first phase, uh, phase of a smart lab. A smart lab, we call them SQMS. What we did with this uh, technology is we automated the entire test and analysis process. So there are three uh, main reasons we actually try this. The first one is we wanted to automate the entire process. So every single one of the, the part and the processes is tagged. Uh, RFID is everywhere. We track the component, we track the UTs until it leaves our facility. And then uh, we actually collect all the data and um, from different customers and uh, we actually provide the uh, traceability information while doing a testing and also after the testing customer may have uh, multiple runs and over multiple years and uh, we can actually extract the information on the trend on the, the new devices uh, how they they fare with the other devices in the same functions all those kind of things the last one is the big data we actually collect the data, but also we actually pipe the data through the customer site directly from us. So for example, like LDT, we generate a tremendous amount of data. We store them in the locally, but also we pipe the information directly real time to the customers. So they, they can see what's going on, uh, what is happening to their component. Next page, please. This is our key customers. Some customers really shy about the putting their logos here, but <clears throat> you may end up, <clears throat> excuse me. There are a lot of customers in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, actually, we do a uh, direct or indirect business with them. You may know many um, the familiar names, but uh, those are our uh, initial customers. So we actually work with institutions and the research a lot of universities has a cooperation with us um, within the Korea, but also internationally. So let me go over uh, my uh, the innovation in big data. Next page, please. <clears throat> so we do uh, two different uh, type of the little ability test to generate a tremendous amount of data. I just mentioned uh, SSD LDT, and it normally we use about a thousand uh, devices, uh, about 2000 hours. Uh, during the time of uh, testing, 
we have a workload as continuously uh, driving the, uh, the uh, SSDs. The focus is to try to figure out the performance of the SSD and also endurance of the SSD and the uh, reliability of the SSD. So we collect all that data and work with customers. As you can imagine, um, cell size is uh, about the 5,200 terabyte per drive. You multiply those to 2,000, 2,000 even, uh, it creates a tremendous amount of data. Uh, complexity of the SOC, uh, when you look at, not only from the hardware perspective, when you look at the uh, software perspective, FTL, garbage collection, wear labeling, super block, uh, never mind the ECC and the, some other ones. It interactions between all of those are the key uh, analysis point for the liability analysis. The second one is we do a um, soft error test. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, soft error. Uh, it is uh, basically based on the notion where neutrons actually hitting the device device get upset. And then upset the state in the device can create the wrong operations. So we do um, almost all device types and we perform the test. Um, normally in case of the memory, it create uh, about a terabyte per device. Uh, we takes about the 12 to uh, the 24 devices. We run about the 24 hours a tremendous amount of data and the customer wanted to figure out not only for the soft error rate, but also to figure out where and how it fails and what is the weak point, how we can fix the soft error rate and also um, how to improve the designs in the next cycle. Um, here, the difficulty is using um, the beam site I actually uh, Los Alamos and some other radiation beam site. Uh, we have to prepare and to bring the equipment and the test the, uh, the uh, crews. And uh, we normally do a 24 hour, almost uh, four or five days straight for a single device. Um, analysis is a kind of nightmare uh, as you can imagine because of the amount of data you have to process. Now already in the last page, um, Okay, uh, why don't you go to the next page, please? And the uh, big data analysis challenge, um, and I actually summarized the two uh, uh, big categories. One is the big data analysis challenge is a 10 year functional safety requirement is for every automotive. Uh, it is a standard based one. So many of the standard require a certain fit number, but ISO 2000 has to be 10 feet or less in terms of functional safety for the engine control unit or anything that is uh, important to the operation of the device for the safety. So uh, you have to maintain this for 10 years. That is not good uh, in terms of managing the data. So next one is big data analysis examples. Um, I mentioned uh, a few of those, but basically um, statistical analysis is the, the new challenge in new areas you have to work on it and the big data and the way is data science has to be uh, everybody's knowledge in order to figure out what is relevant data, what is not relevant data from those we have to figure out not only for the failure, but weak point, warranty, maintenance, and all the cost related. Thank, oh, thank you very much. You. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's move to Brandon. So uh, he's back now with the technology all worked out. Brandon, go ahead. Thank you, Sean. All right. Hi. Hopefully my uh, audio works. I just had a security breach here. Right? Yes, we, we have audio, good audio now. Yeah. <laughs> on the screen. Actually, I didn't know where do I stop. So I'm going to quickly just start from the, the first page. You guys see the see my screen? Yes, your screen is coming yes. through fine. All right. So we have a hacker broke into the casino high rollers database through a fish tank that network Wi-Fi connected 
thermostat a couple of years ago. And then we have electrical car breakdown because of the safety system is um, being bypassed. Uh, so again, through physical tampering. And the, the, this is the scary one, is the guy be able to hack hundreds of plants from the ground by having an IoT device connected to the passenger, passenger that's in the airplane. So these are a few examples present the security uh, threat we are facing right now. It's beyond the classic security things we do, which is secure our network and put the software security layer. We need to really seriously look at what is additional security thing that we need to do in order to you know, improve our overall system level security and the particularly involve in SOCs, IPs, and all the sensors around the edge devices. You know, as a IC designer, you know, every day we optimize our chip based on power, performance, and area, right? Reduce the power, increase the speed, and reduce the area. With security in mind, we need to add one more item, as DARPA coined it, it's called PASS, P-A-S-S, -S, that we need to look at optimize around power, area, speed, and security at the same time. And that is the new kind of challenge you're facing. You look at semiconductor threats across the entire supply chain. It is started from design, of course, with IP threat. And also, it could happen in the supply chain to the foundry. There are malware insertion. Again, reverse engineering happened at assembly and test, and even in distribution. So security really is an issue across the entire supply chain. And because of that, in hardware security, we're going to go back to the basic of the security model, which uh, Wally mentioned in his privacy computing session, is this zero trust security model. You know, think about the way that we design product today over the internet, using internal, external human resource across all countries. It is hard to vet all the aspects of your development process. So when security is the utmost importance, we rely on a, a framework, which we call the zero trust security model. And I'm going to show you how it reflected particularly in the hardware SOC design. Let's recall a back in a high level look at what is SOC architecture, right? This is really a very simplified view of, of, of the SOC design. You have a CPU in the middle that often augmented by specialized processing capabilities like signal processing, graphics, videos, image processing, and some nowadays even artificial neurons, right? Typically, the SOC subsystem are completely trusted. What that means is that the SOC, all the interconnect fabric and server, everything is really at the trust of the CPU. But now, given that we need to enhance the hardware security, the increasingly the SOC incorporate, we call the root of trust or secure enclave subsystem. And that is that we're gonna put something based on zero trust model, means that we're not gonna be by default trusting the CPU to authenticate the bootstrap process by itself. So these sub modules entities will be assessed and assess controlled before enable, you know, fulfill the entire primary uh, end user um, mission function. So you see at the bottom left corner, we put under the root of trust, the big uh, item is called a PUF, P-U-F, a physical unclonable function, P-U-F. It is a physical object that for any given input and condition provide a physical level defined digital fingerprint that serve as a unique identification. To further enhance the security, um, so on top of root of trust functionality, we can now layer on secure bootstrap storage and then add this uh, cryptographic key management to secure the, the debug, the test case, and ability to perform a secure update to software and firmware. And here's where the software hardware core design come into play. And we add a runtime access control policies detecting of the 
you know, the abnormal behaviors and measurement, expectations of subsistence state. Now you'll be able to detect a truly hack. So incorporate these means to enable SOC's capability and provide that identification, authentication, and the device that have a control of limited access to only a certain group of certifiable clients. So we can even add more to add a firewall around the, the system sub, sub bus. And that allows us to, to do a static and a dynamic policy limits in the subsystem that connected to the SOCs. Controls that including, you know, the IO access filters to limit subsystem communications, uh, attaining certain operation status, MPUs, MMUs, and also it's gonna provide a limits on access to the memory address range, um, maybe uh, multi different region encryptions, authentication, external or shared memory. And that is all through the firewall provide additional layer of security. The ability to monitor behaviors like power level, reset event, some sort of bus traffic that cause, um, um, you know, abnormal behaviors that can be all circled back to the zero trust environment. And with that, we add analytics to the mix. Now you can even detect a device that is um, compromised. So that's the SOC level. Now to build the SOC, you have many, many security IP to make it happen. I'm not gonna dive down to the detail. You look at the, you know, the critical IP, the security protocols accelerator, a lot of content protection IP, and, and, and of course, the root of trust the basic trust execution environment that they need to be built in the SOC. Now, with all these high level architecture, you still go down to say, how am I gonna be do it in the implementation level to apply, to apply that level of security? I listed a few very commonly used example in the design for security solution, uh, such as locking, obfuscation, encryption, and the watermarking. I don't have time to dive into this detail, but these are the function really needed. Even with you uh, have a secure architecture, you need the implementation to be level up to the security level. The last item I want to mention in my talk is really security is not limited by the design phase. It is actually across the entire life cycle of a silicon, as Norman mentioned. Uh, it, it's not just, you know, look at the supply chain that you need to actually monitor the infield application as well as we look at. So the general approach is to adding monitor and sensors to intelligently uh, monitor the entire system. Now the SOC actually is a system. People are familiar with the product life management, PLM in the system, but the, because now you're putting in a system into a silicon. So that's what we really need a silicon life cycle management in order to optimize the data and provide insight that including predictive maintenance. So by tracking these with silicon and started announced the data across the pre-designed data, silicon test data, field data, that we'll be able to achieve, achieve the entire silicon life uh, cycle and, and then really improve the overall uh, security level. So that's what I cover in terms of the design parameters, the hardware hacks, the model of zero trust, and then the tool to do design for security automatically. And then back to the system, you ultimately have a silicon lifecycle management to monitor the securities. So the last item, I just wanna say something for my company synopsis is the only company right now actually covers both software side and hardware side of security. We have a large $300 billion in software and number one in software security. Meanwhile, wow. our business, everybody knows that we have, you know, the, the, the design automation tool and the IP, including many security function that's showing on the screen. So love to share more of this information. Dave? 